some general strategies to help you decide whether you should invest in the expensive batteries or go for bargain basement. Hello everybody, I am Nick the Naval Architect. Naval architects and engineers, we admittedly create a lot. Hello everybody, I am Nick the Naval Architect. Sorry we had a bit of a bumpy start there. Uh, the computer always picks the worst time to act up. So before we get started today with the live stream, uh, I did want to talk about briefly about the Titan. Uh, that's not the subject of today's live stream, but I have gotten many questions about the tragedy of the submersible of the Titan. And honestly, the answer is that I can't tell you much. Uh, my respect, my sympathies go out to the families. This is probably going to be some of the worst times of their lives. Uh, but there has been on social media, a wave of people wanting to criticize and uh, design and play secondhand decisions on the design of the Titan. My attitude as a professional engineer is that I cannot comment on that because I don't have the facts. I have seen secondhand knowledge, interviews, and brief segments of video clips. Those don't count as facts. And as a professional engineer, uh, I am required to be objective and truthful in everything that I portray to the public, and that includes avoiding misleading statements. I have seen a lot of social media uh, people out there who have been trying to criticize the Titan only to retract their own statements a little bit later once they see that they have more information. So I'm not going to be a part of that and instead just simply state that I know we want answers, but these things do take time to uncover the truth behind the perceptions, and that will have to require patience. In the meantime, all I can report on are the very few facts that I do know. So transitioning from that to the topic of today's discussion is the practical design of ship structures. Today we're going to focus on efficient engineering. and. This actually made me think because there is quite a relevant segment here related to the design of the Titan. You see, there's been a lot of criticism about that vessel where people are saying they don't have a culture of safety and there's a debate about whether they, th there's a perception of a conflict between the desire for safety and budget. And I would actually say that from an engineering perspective, I, I have seen that in real industry, that engineering can be expensive and there is a desire to minimize it. The goal and the practical side of efficient engineering is to understand that constraint and try to find a strategy where there is no conflict, where we can bring everything within a reasonable budget. And that very much applies to the structural design of ships. So today we are going to go over the different analysis methods of efficient engineering in ship structural design. This is the first in a three-part series on practical structural design. And what I mean by analysis methods here is we're at the stage where you have laid out your ship structure. You know generally where your bulkheads are going to be, where your beams are going to be supporting the hull, and where the plates are going to be but you don't know the sizes for any of it. You don't know how thick your plates are. You don't know how strong your beams will be. 
all of that now is in the analysis stage where we are applying mathematics to find the correct safe sizes for all of that. And there are different tools that we have available to achieve that. So I'm going to go over the three primary tools that we use. First principles analysis, scantling calculations, and finite element analysis, or FEA for short. And you might be thinking to yourself, okay, three options, who's going to win? Which is the best option? What I'm actually going to say right from the beginning is the best option is actually a combination of all three. And the practical part of efficient engineering is learning the strengths and weaknesses of each of them so you know when to use each tool. First up is first principles analysis. These are the basic beam bending equations. It's the stuff you learn right there at university. Uh, it's a pretty basic, uh, I don't want to say it's basic, but it's, um, it's core physics, we'll say. There are very few simplifications to it. And that's the beautiful part about first principles. You can be very, very accurate. You can be very confident of your results because we're not going to develop an equation and then apply it to every single beam on the ship. We are developing a single equation that describes the bending of one beam, that beam right there, this equation. That's how specific first principles can get, where you're looking at the exact length of the beam, the exact position of reinforcements on it. All of that is in first principles analysis and that specificity is really beautiful for high confidence. But it's also a huge burden. Specificity, you know, if I have to develop a new equation for every single beam, there could be 5,000 to 5 million beams on a ship. That is a lot of effort. Even worse though is, now that I've developed the equation, what goes into it? So let's take a typical task here is you need to design a plate and a stiffener to resist the sea loads on a section of the ship's hull. Okay, sounds simple enough. We have the ship's hull here, we have a plate, we have a little stiffener coming into the side, and there are uh, sea loads pushing on the outside. Beautiful. Okay, let's run into our first principle calculations. Uh-oh. Sea loads. Sea loads is not a number. Sea loads is just a generic term. So what is the pressure for a sea load? How many kilopascals do I need to apply to my plate? And that is not an easy question to answer. It turns out there are dozens of different variables and even worse, dozens of different scenarios we have to consider when we're looking at the environmental loads on our ship's structure. That means that you have to consider all these possibilities. And here's a secret about engineers. We aren't magic. We don't know the answer right at the beginning. So if you tell me that there are 50 possible scenarios that this beam could be subjected to, I cannot automatically go, oh, abracadabra, it's scenario number 35. No, that's not how it works. If there are 50 scenarios that this beam has to resist, I have to go through and check all 50 scenarios to find out which is the one we need to worry about. That's extremely labor intensive. And that's why first principles analysis is not something that we want to use as a general design tool. We don't want to apply this everywhere on the ship because there are just too many variables to analyze. It would turn into a huge research project just to design one ship. Speaking of research projects, this was actually the answer. Is we said, we need somebody to go out there and really come up with some common sense answers to all of these possible scenarios. The answer for that was the class society. Uh, this is a separate group within the marine community. There are multiple companies that you can pick from, ABS, DNVGL, uh, those are just a few of them, uh, ISO Yachts, Lloyd's Register, you know, all of those graphics on your screen. These companies, uh, what they do is they look at the design of a ship and provide a third party review to say yes or no, is that good? And that very much helps the insurance companies decide whether or not they should insure the ship. But that gives these class societies a huge advantage from a research perspective because they get the detailed drawings showing every single part of the design of the ship. And they have hundreds if not thousands of records for all of these ships. 
So they have access to all of these ships that are going out being subjected to the same environmental loads. That gives them a massive data set to start looking for patterns. And that is generally what they did. They found these patterns and developed what we call scantling calculations, which are empirical formulas based upon the trends from reviewing dozens and uh, I would say hundreds of ship records comparing the success of that ship to its structural design. And this is our general design tool. We will use this for 90% of the ship's structure will be designed with scantling calculations because they are just so efficient in their application. They are conservative, but they are very, very efficient. All you need are some simple dimensions for the ship's hull. And if you know length, beam, depth, and displacement, that will get you most of the way there towards sizing all of the structure on your ship. Like I said, it doesn't do it for everything, but the goal was to do it for most of the ship. Now, I've said quite a bit about how I like scantling calculations. Don't think that they are perfect things in existence. They do have some downsides. First off, these are empirical formulas, which means that we're basing them on fitting trend lines to data sets. And there is a little bit of black magic that goes into these. I, I have had scenarios where I have called up classicities and asked for a better understanding about what one coefficient meant, some odd number, you know, 3.2854 times length. Well, what the heck is 3.8254? Where, where did that number come from? And several times I, I've had scenarios where the class society has just come back and said, yeah, we don't know anymore. That was developed decades ago and the person that developed it has since quit. We don't know. So that, those things do happen. That is a limitation of scantling calculations. Even worse is that they are fitted and designed around specific ship sizes. So for example, I quite often use rules that are intended for vessels 300 or 90 meters and less in length. What they actually mean is vessels that are around 60 to 90 meters. That, that was the data set they really used. So if I'm down here trying to design a, a vessel that's only 12 meters in length, uh, sometimes the rules don't make sense. And that's all a limitation. So we don't take scantling calculations on blind faith. Instead, we uh, use them combined with first principles analysis. And the general strategy, like I said, is that you're going to use your scantling calculations for the majority of your ship. And then you're going to supplement that with your first principles calcs or your FEA. And in cases where the scantling calculations are producing really odd results, uh, erroneous things. For example, I've had them call for a plate that was half inch thick to resist a, a little tiny yacht where we could normally get away with almost tin foil. In those scenarios, you're going to do additional checks with first principles to see what's going on there and always have a sound basis. Uh, this is one of the principles of engineering analysis is I am not allowed to just ignore a rule because I don't like the answer. I can absolutely criticize the rule and see if it might not be accurate, but I need to be able to replace that with something else, some other rational reason. You can't just ignore things because you don't like the answer. That definitely is rule number one for engineering analysis. So talking about replacing things with something more accurate. FEA is our third tool, and it definitely falls in the realm of something more accurate. So finite element analysis is where we are now using the computer to model our entire ship structure and solve it in very, very great detail. Uh, the high-level version of FEA, I'll, I won't tell you how the computer does it, but more just to say this is a simulation-based approach, and you can get a huge amount of accuracy out of it. We have been designing with FEA for 50 plus years now. It's a very mature technology and very reliable. So we love it. Uh, it used to be in the early days when I started my career, people thought of FEA as a specialty item, 
something that would only happen in rare cases if you had large budgets. Those days are gone. FEA is no longer a specialty item. It's a common item. Uh, class societies will, in fact, expect to see an FEA for critical structure. It's something that we will use all over the place, and I would say it should be one of the staple tools of any structural engineer. The reason we love it, really, is all of the flexibility in our structural design. Uh, if I can draw it, FEA can analyze it. And that generality allows me a lot of freedom to really focus on optimizing my structure. It used to be that we would design our structure specifically in a way to ensure that the math was accurate. Um, there's a common phrase they say in engineering, the horse is a box. The, the implication there being that we made the horse into a box shape because I had math that could analyze a box. Uh, same thing for structural design in ships. That restriction does not apply for FEA. Uh, the mathematics for FEA are not specific to any one shape of structure. They're very generic that way. So that allows us a lot more time and a lot more detail to really focus in on our structure, find the spots where it's overbuilt, and eliminate excess weight. Downside though, all of that does not come for free. It is a very expensive and very slow process, and it is a one-way process. Uh, when we talk about simulation, you know, simulation is always a one-way process where you do a guess, you say, I think the structure should look like this, and then FEA says, well, it was over your li critical limits at these points. You can't really work that in reverse. You can't tell FEA saying, I want you to stay under your criti these critical limits. Tell me what the structure should look like. Uh, I, and I will say you can't really. Uh, there are some cutting edge FEA tools right now where you can somewhat do that, but it's still not a super easy or super refined process. And so that goes back to the problem of very expensive and very slow. So it's a good tool, good and bad. Where do we use that? As I said, this is not a specialty tool. It is going to be a commonplace item used in all major structural design. Well, where? First off is any critical structure. Um, Multi-hulls especially. So if you're talking about catamarans or trimarans, if you look at all of the uh, class society rules and you go into the drill down through their rules and you're looking through those different sections, that they have rules for catamarans and trimarans. And then you get to the section of the cross deck, the part that connects the different hulls together. And they almost all uniformly say that they expect an FEA. There are very limited circumstances when you would not do an FEA on a multi-hull. Second one would be a global hull girder. So if we're looking at the entire ship, most of our scantling calculations look at the ship in isolation. The global hull girder is where we're modeling the entire hull from bow to stern. Not every single piece. We're not looking at the tiny little brackets. We're looking at the big structures, the beams that are as tall as you. We're looking to see how those interact when the whole hull flexes up and down. And we're checking for those concentrations. So that's another scenario of critical structure. Uh, the next thing that I would say is concentrated loads. So anything that's really, really a lot of weight in a small space, you'll probably do an FEA because ship structure is generally designed to handle distributed loads. We're looking at the even pressure of the ocean. Concentrated loads like your engines, a crane, or a gun mount, uh, those are all things where we would probably need FEA to see how the stress is distributed to the rest of the hull. I can tell you, gun mounts especially, I've, I've designed a few gun mounts for some naval applications. Uh, even just small, um, not really handguns, but small personnel style guns, they can be a huge challenge for structural design. And then of course there's the final caveat of anything that looks weird. You know, that one, uh, anything that you haven't seen before, we will normally go to FEA to verify our assumptions. So unique hulls, uh, one that I can think of especially is an articulated tug barge. That's a 
a barge that has a tug actually connected to the back through two giant pins. Uh, they, they come out of the side of the tug and hook into the barge. So just stop and think about that unique structure is to say, so you see this giant tug back here that's nothing but a massive floating engine with a huge powerhouse? Yeah, I want to put all of that power and focus it through just two tiny pin connections. That would be an FEA, definitely. Um, by the way, they're not tiny, actually. The, the pins are usually about as tall as I am. So those are our three tools that I wanted to review for efficient engineering. Nine, I would say scantlings are the common solution that we use for most of the things. We'll apply that for 90% of our structure. That's our general design tool. And it's meant to be conservative. Then we get to the, the specific and critical structures. And for those, we'll either use our first principle calculations or we will use FEA. Now, I've been describing all of this theory, and the fact is, you don't exactly need to know the theory in some senses. Because I've taken all of these calculations and wrapped them up and put them in spreadsheets that I could give to somebody and tell them to run through it all. So the question becomes, with all of that theory, do people need to know all of that to apply it? I'm not sure if every person on the design team needs to have the full theoretical background, but there definitely needs to be at least one person that understands all of this theory. Because I can tell you, practical structural design is not rules. They didn't send me to school and have me memorize all of these rules. Everything that I put together from these presentations came from applying theory to real life and seeing where it needs to be fine-tuned. So the theory is still your guide, it is the main core of knowledge that you always check on things with. And it will always be the, the, the touchstone to ensure that your practical approach is still valid. That there is, remember how I said before, you're not allowed to ignore the answer just because you don't like it. You need a rational basis for your design. The theory is our grounding. It is our statement of our rational basis. And that's why it's always going to couple with our practical design to give us this combination of methods for efficient analysis. Thanks very much. Okay, I am going to now open the floor up to some questions and I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. Uh, just go ahead and type them into the chat window and uh, we'll s basically I'll stay around for until uh, the top of the hour or until everybody's questions get answered. We'll see which comes first. So feel free to ask away. So there was one comment that I, I do have to love uh, from Christian Nally is, how much does a cow weigh start with a spherical cow? Yes, absolutely. That, that is exactly how we do that in engineering. And it actually underlies a great principle of structural analysis, which is that you don't always have to be perfect. Uh, you don't always need to have the exact correct equation for the, that exact scenario. There's a lot of times when we will start with an analog, a similar scenario, and then adjust it a little bit. And that's actually how a lot of engineering discovery happens, is start from what you know and see if you can apply it to what you do not know. And quite often the answer is no, you cannot apply it. But the benefit is you have now discovered exactly what went wrong in the application. And that's the real advantage of um, starting with a less than perfect solution. And, and that's where we get the joke of you know, calling the cow a sphere or a box. Uh, I, I've actually done that a couple times myself and it, it does work. So far, n no questions yet. Um,
Well, we'll give it a little bit more time, see if anything pops up. While people are waiting, um, talking about uh, the submersible, the Titan, the one thing that I would like to state about it, and, and I am not talking about the submersible, but rather some of the manufacturing methods associated with it, is there has been some criticism of the carbon fiber pressure hull. I've got to be very careful about that because there's a lot of thoughts that go into a carbon fiber composite material. I've designed composite materials myself. I've worked with carbon fiber. And I would just say that I don't think I have yet seen anything on social media that is really acknowledging all the complexities that go into that. There are, it can, it has the capacity to be a very, very strong material. I have worked with uh, pressure vessels uh, that were designed to handle pressurized air with pressures equivalent to probably twice the design depth of the Titan. And those were carbon fiber pressure vessels. So the capacity exists. The, the challenge definitely is in the design of it and in the manufacturing verification. And so I really hope that one of the things that comes out of this is that people don't uniformly condemn composite manufacturing or carbon fiber as a material. It's, it's not a generic assumption. It always depends on the application. Okay, well, if there are no questions, then I'm going to say thank you very much for attending. And, oh wait, something just came through. Ah, so this is unrelated to ship structures, but I'm happy to answer the question. Um, oh, and, okay. So now we've got some good questions coming through. Excellent, now I, I have something to talk about other than just standing up here and looking silly. <laughs> so one of the questions, is there any difference with the analysis on small yachts uh, compared to bigger vessels? The, the, there is definitely a difference between the two. I would say primarily two differences actually, is number one, with small yachts we're very much less worried about longitudinal strength, the bending of the hull. On a small yacht, that is such a small concern that usually just the, sh the shell plating, the sides of the hull itself, uh, provide enough strength to resist that longitudinal bending. Whereas on a large, say 600 meter long ocean going tanker, the shell plating is nowhere near strong enough. We have to put in several special beams just to handle that load. So the scenarios that we're worried about differ quite a bit. The one thing that is a challenge for smaller yachts is wave slamming. A large ship, you know, again going to our 600 meter long tanker, if a wave hits that tanker at full speed, the tanker barely moves, the tanker barely notices it. It will sort of gently roll up and back down on top of a wave. Whereas a small yacht is much larger, if it hits that wave, it can go actually airborne and then smack down. If you've ever dived off of a very high tank or a very high platform and hit a, the water, you know that hitting the water at high speed is very, very painful. The technical term for this in the ship design community is slamming. And slamming can produce extremely high momentary pressures on yachts. That is probably the biggest challenge for the design of structures on yachts. The other thing that we have to deal with on yachts that's a little bit unique is sails. You know, there are sailing yachts out there. 
and it does take engineering to design them. That's a whole separate scenario. Of how do you design, how strong do you make the mast? Because you don't necessarily know how hard the wind is blowing. And for that scenario, we actually usually base the, the mast design not on the force that the sails will produce, but the maximum resistance that the hull can produce. Because it doesn't matter how hard the wind is blowing, unless the hull can resist that turning moment, then the hull's just going to lay flat and shed that force. And so in that scenario, the hull becomes our guide for our mast design. Let's see, I believe there was another unrelated, so this question is not related to ship structures, uh, but asking, is there a formal definition of an X-bow um, that would let you clearly differentiate from the different types of inverted bows, such as wave piercers? Uh, the, I, I'm going to be a little tongue in cheek here. The formal definition is, yeah, if you buy it from Ulsting, um, Ulsting owns the X-Bow design. They are the, they have the patent on that. And so they are the official providers of the X-Bow. Uh, looking at it compared to wave piercers and other inverted bows, the main differentiating feature is that if you look at the cross section of the X-Bow, if you could take a slice through the hull right near the bow, you'll see that the X-Bow has vertical hull, uh, vertical sides going up. It, it's pretty much parallel in its path. Whereas wave piercing bows will actually be more of a teardrop shape. They'll be wide at the bottom and their sides actually taper in as they go upwards. So that, that's the primary difference. Let's see. Um, are the classification houses, here's another one from, and I do apologize, I'm going to, to butcher this name. Uh, J. Mang Cortizas, uh, are the classification houses supposed to provide the resistance parameters of the materials, or should they always be obtained by empirical testing? That is a very excellent question and leads to a huge discussion, which I will try to keep short. The answer is it varies a little bit on the material. So the standard answer is if we're building with steel, that is the preferred material. And yes, the classification societies do provide the strength parameters of that material. There are actually special grades of steel specific to the classification societies. So for example, if we want to build a boat that's being classed by the American Bureau of Shipping, we will actually specify that they have to get ABS grade A steel. Now, that's a double-sided verification because the class society has told us as the designer what we can expect for material strength from ABS grade A steel. At the same time, the class society has told the steel foundry, here is the recipe for ABS grade A steel. Here are the material properties that you should achieve and test to prove that you've gotten it with ABS grade A steel. And, the sim and that's for one class society. You get similar properties for all of the others as well. Uh, the name changes, but it's the same effect. Now, the other advantage to this is they did not invent a whole new brand of steel. The ABS grade A, it's very similar to the recipe for common mild steel. And so you can quite often ensure that the actual design of the steel and the resistance parameters, that's going to be the same across the board for every class society with just minor tweaks, mostly the only difference is the documentation that changes. That, you know, we have to make sure it comes with the sticker saying ABS approved. Uh, now, one thing that's a little bit more interesting though, is when we get to the world of composite materials. So when we're talking fiberglass, E-glass, S-glass, epoxy, uh, carbon fiber, all of those materials, the thing that's fascinating about them is they don't come from a foundry their material properties depend on the person doing the assembly. And so there are still specifications from the class societies for those, but those specifications are based upon the absolute worst, most inept shipyard that you could find. 
because we always assume worst case scenario. And we assume that the designer does not have control over who is building the ship. Those are usually two separate groups. And so if you're looking up class society rules to design a composite hull, quite often you're selling yourself short because the material properties they will provide are just so far short of what is actually possible. And in those are scenarios where I would actually tell the shipyard and the owner, get your materials tested, you know, get your decent crew out there to provide a representative sample. Because if we do have those test reports, if we do have that test data, we are allowed to use the better information. And that can save you on a composite vessel, probably 10 to 20% sometimes in your structural weight. So that is a huge factor to consider is the class society set the minimum. You're always encouraged to go above and beyond and do better than the minimum. Okay, uh, let's see if we have any other questions that come up. Otherwise, you can see my beautiful improv skills as I stare stoically into the camera. Okay, well, I'm going to give this a few more minutes to see if any other questions pop up. In the meantime, I will talk just a little bit about uh, composite materials in general because they're some of my favorite subjects and I think they are one of the things we very much do not appreciate with them is how much the, the quality of manufacturing affects the final performance of the design. Um, what I would say for composite materials, it, it, like I said, we always assume the worst case scenario for the design, but there are some, some mm. well, let, let's just talk about sort of the classic fa foibles that I've always seen of people doing things wrong. One thing is, for example, carbon fiber. Everyone emphasizes carbon fiber as the material. Carbon fiber is only half of your mixture. The other half is your, is your resin, the glue that holds everything together. And there are options in resins just the same as there are for the fibers. So there's definitely one statement that when you're looking at using carbon fiber, you should already have dis decided that you're going to the stronger uh, resin, which is typically a form of epoxy. Those need to go hand in hand. And that's why you'll typically see people talking about carbon epoxy matrices versus carbon polyester. It's not that you can't do carbon polyester, it's just that you're paying so much for the carbon fiber that you absolutely want to use the other half of that, that resin, of getting a good resin, to make sure you actually get good value for your money out of that. Oh, awesome, we've got uh, chronology here. Thank you, you've been following me from the very beginning. That I remember the humble days when I was excited when every single additional uh, viewer would pop up. So thank you very much for that. Let's see. Um, so just talking a little bit more to fill some space uh, to see if any other questions have uh, come up. Uh, composite materials, you know, like I said, we, we focus on carbon fiber, but I actually prefer the, the more value conscious method is to only use carbon fiber in areas where you need it and then go to more modestly priced materials like E-glass or S-glass because your standard fiberglass, uh, that's what we call E-glass, 
And carbon fiber, I believe, is three to six times more expensive than e-glass. So there's a huge price difference there, and you get a strong motivation to only use carbon fiber where you need it. Um, I've seen carbon fiber used purely for decoration, and it, it, it's a fun if you like the pattern, but the, it, it, my little structural heart weeps for that, thinking, no, no, please only use this where you need it. And there are other alternatives. Like I said, there's S-glass. Um, that's a little known alternative for fiberglass. You see, um, E-glass was originally designed not for structural purposes. Uh, it had its origins back in the electrical world, I believe. We're getting into history, which is not my strongest stamp um, point. Um, but originally, it was not designed for structural purposes. And that's why it was called E, for electrical glass. They then came up with another version, S-glass, which was intended for structural purposes. And that's uh, noticeably stronger than the E-glass. And that's a beautiful half step between uh, going from normal fiberglass to full carbon fiber, is if you want just a little extra weight savings without breaking the bank. Uh, those are some beautiful options that we can consider. OK. well. At this point, I believe there are no more qu Oh, quick question that came up. Perfect. An excellent question of have they, do they use different types of glass when manufacturing fiberglass? Uh, I think I actually have heard of borosilicate fiberglass. It's fairly new, so uh, aside from the name, that's a, about all I know about it. Uh, the, the, uh, yeah, I, I, that's really all I can say. Most fiberglass has been pretty standardized, but there are some alternatives coming in, uh, especially in the aircraft industry. They use different materials specifically, not for high strength, but for high temperature. So there are composite uh, turbine blades uh, out there as well that are intended should handle high temperatures better. And that's where we start looking at ceramic com composites as well, which leads to a different question that somebody asked is, uh, this is from Technopro, do I think silicon carbide and other ceramics might replace steel as a primary shipbuilding material in the future? Not yet is the short answer. And the main reason for that is that all of the uh, all of those other materials, they don't, any ceramic based material is going to perform much poorer in fatigue, uh, which is what I'll be talking about next time. But to the short version of that talk is that fatigue is probably the primary concern for any ship life. It's what limits the ultimate lifespan of a ship hull. And so getting materials that perform well and have a good fatigue life is one of the primary concerns of ship design. And that's why we have still, to this day, stuck with metals. Uh, aluminum, alloys, and steel, steel are probably still some of our most favorite materials in the commercial industry. And it has to do primarily with their reliability. Uh, there are better materials out there, but none that have such a proven performance record as steel and aluminums. The other reason we like steel and aluminum is fire. There's a great concern of fire on board ships. And one of the simplest strategies for firefighting on board a ship is if you get a fire breaking out in a compartment, close the compartment, the steel bulkheads will contain it, and let it burn itself out. Uh, clearly, actual practical firefighting gets a lot more complicated depending on what's on the other side of your bulkhead and what's inside the compartment. But the important part is you can't do that necessarily with a lot of the composites. Even ceramic composites, the resin that's holding them together is what burns. And so we have to worry about fire concerns for a lot of our structural materials. And OK, we've got some more questions coming in now. Mm. So here's an excellent question from, I, I do apologize if I butcher this name, but 
um, Machio Zelitin. I hope I got that somewhere right. Uh, can we use multiple types of composites with different orientations in one single structure to give more resistance? Absolutely, yes, you should. That is good design. That is um, actually how you achieve the best performance out of composites. And he, um, he or she, they asked a very important question there about the orientations of the fibers in these composites. Uh, there's a beautiful diagram that I have in a textbook somewhere that it shows uh, the strength of different breaking tests on a composite fiber, and it shows at different angles. You start by pulling straight in line with the fibers, and then even pulling a few degrees off of straight in line with the fibers, their strength drops down to a fraction of what they were originally. So there's a huge motivation to make sure that your composite materials are oriented correctly to match the stress patterns in your ship. And there are multiple different types of composite fabrics out there to handle this. What's a very common scenario, uh, especially talking about the trade-off between fiberglass and um, carbon fiber, is that we will use fiberglass uh, bi-directional mats, meaning that the fabric actually has fibers running in both directions. We'll use that as our generic general material over the majority of the hull. But for sections where we have a clearly defined stress pattern, where we know the orientation of the, strats, of the stresses, we will then use a unidirectional carbon fiber. A unidirectional means that you buy a fabric, all the fibers are running in one direction. And that will be then placed just in those high stress areas as a reinforcement. And that's a beautiful scenario because you could pay for the carbon or for the fiberglass for 90% of your ship, and in these few key areas where you might have to put in, uh, you know, 50 pounds or 20 kilograms extra car of fiberglass just to handle that, uh, you can replace that with a few kilograms of carbon fiber, and it costs you maybe 50 to 100 dollars at most because. Carbon fiber might be expensive, but if you only need a few meters of it, it's not that bad. And so, yes, absolutely design and orientation of composite materials is the sign of a good engineer. Do, 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 do. Clearly, I'm going to have to find some more topics to uh, share the space or to fill in the dead space. Um, yeah, uh, I can talk quite a bit about ship structures. I, I think that they are. I, I will say for anybody out there that is trying to think, how do I ask an engineer to build the best boat possible? Uh, people always focus on the the sexy parts, you know, give me the strongest engine possible, or the best propeller, or I want it to have super low resistance. And that's missing the obvious solution, frankly. If you want a high performance boat, most of those things you're not going to get any miracle solutions out of. You know, propellers, uh, there's no miracle propeller out there that's going to do so, so much better than all the rest. Engines are a mature technology, there are no miracle engines out there. And in terms of the boat, you know, people imagine that there's some magic shape that will make the boat have super low resistance. Look, at the end of the day, I'm still pushing a hole through the water. I, I still have to get the water out of the way. So uh, there are no miracle solutions there either. The real key thing to look at, if you want to achieve a super high performance vessel, the area where you will achieve the most benefit is in your structural design because a super efficient structure saves weight. And the lighter your ship is, the less power that it takes to move it through the water, which means smaller engines, slower operating costs, lower maintenance costs, uh, all of that. And so 
the, the key feature, if you want that groundbreaking vessel, that thing that's going to do better than all the other people, look at your structure and look at your ship's weight. They're not sexy, they're not fun, and they're hard to understand, and that is why those are the areas where you can achieve major benefits. And I'll give that another 30 seconds, and if there are no other questions, that sounds like a perfect place to uh, end the live stream. Okay, well, I'm going to say thank you very much, everyone. I greatly appreciate you showing up, and uh, we'll have this also posted up for viewing again later if you want to review it. And thanks, I have been Nick, the Naval Architect.